What if I told you that the most valuable resource in the world is not land, gold, diamonds, or oil, instead is something we all can obtain, many times with just one click of a button. I'm talking about information. Information is the most valuable resource in the world because it allows you to bend the world at your will. The more you know, the greater your advantage. Information is the currency of power. And when it comes down to getting the upper hand in life, information is the deciding factor. You can study for three hours every day for two weeks straight to get an A on your calculus final, or you can just get a hold of the answer key and save yourself all that time and effort and get the same exact result. That's the power of information, the ability to know your opponent's moves before they even step foot into the ring. Now of course, as stated earlier, we all can obtain various pieces of information in our everyday lives. That seems very rudimentary and normal, so how can information be this valuable if it's so ubiquitous? Well, simply put, not all information is created the same. Some pieces of information are extremely more valuable than others, even confidential, something that is hidden from the public, and as a result, they are much more classified and harder to obtain. Information that can turn the tide of a war, uncover a lucrative investment opportunity, expose a beloved public figure, or even expose innumerable government slash corporate secrets. That's where the spy comes in, aka the individuals who are able to get a hold of the most secretive pieces of information in the most guarded and classified places that this world has to offer. This is the art of the spy. Now, Contrary to pop culture and public perception, spies are not one single superhuman individual who infiltrates an entire nation, extracts top secret information, and single-handedly saves the world all by themselves. Neither are they a top secret squad of a handful of highly specialized individuals. No, spies are just one single aspect of an entire network with a bunch of moving parts all working hand in hand to infiltrate foreign nations and corporations. Each aspect deals with a combination of subterfuge, deception, technology, and data analysis to achieve the end result of extracting top secret information from foreign nations in complete secrecy without drawing any suspicion. So let's say you and an enemy nation are on the verge of war, tensions are rising and in order to gain the upper hand in case war does erupt, you want to know your opponent's military strength and potential strategies beforehand so you know what to expect. You want to obtain that highly classified and heavily guarded information, hence you decide to create an espionage network to carry out this mission. Let's call it the IMF. Well, the IMF starts with the recruiter, or as many may call it, the officer. The name is pretty self-explanatory. The recruiter recruits potential spy candidates, of which there are two types. Type number one, there are potential spies within the enemy nation who are likely to turn against their nation. These are the top candidates because they already have an identity and can immediately provide valuable information. They don't have to spend time working their way up the ranks and memorizing a cover, they're already there. Now, to recruit these types of individuals, the recruiter of course has to be a great persuader and communicator, but they must also live and work in the enemy nation, within the embassy, where they will hold a legitimate job. This is their cover as it is a strong reason as to why they are in the enemy country. Hence, they work their legitimate job within the embassy, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, to draw away any suspicion, and then only after hours do they conduct their secretive missions. This is where they will recruit, befriend, and build trust with the prospective spy. But you may be wondering, what makes a prospective spy? How do you get someone to commit treason, to just turn on their home country? 
Well, the prospect must either have an ideological disagreement with their country or offered a large amount of money to do spy work, have the desire to be someone important, maybe they work a boring, meaningless job but have access to some confidential information, hence they can become somewhat famous by leaking that info out. Also, they may simply be blackmailed, maybe the government has rumors of an affair, secrets, compromising photos that the prospect would not want leaked to the public. Or they're just physically threatened. The point is, there are numerous ways to recruit and convert prospects into full-blown spies for your government, especially when all options are on the table. And type number one are the top targets by far. However, there is also a type number two. Spies can also be trained and recruited from your own country and deployed into the enemy nation where they will take on a cover and legend. A cover is a secret identity and a legend is all of the background information and documentation behind that identity. Hence, let's say a US agent will take the cover of a Russian accountant to sneak into Russia. In order to do so, they will need to speak Russian, know all about the Russian financial laws, and will have to have a fake backstory that they must memorize. Where did you go to school? Do you have a diploma to prove it? Where were you born? Who is your ex-wife? What are your hobbies? If the legend states that the agent enjoys tennis, they better have some tennis equipment in their house and so forth. The agent must memorize all of these facts. They pretty much need to become, transform into this fake identity, this character, because one slip up will blow their cover. So it is extremely challenging, however we're not done just yet because once the spy establishes a cover, they may have to spend years doing their legitimate job in order to build trust and dismiss any suspicion. These people lead regular lives. They wake up in a rented apartment, have coffee, then off to their usual job, eat lunch, back to work, then home, dinner, and finally bed. Nothing exciting, but on occasion, as they settle into the country, as they socialize locally, they will meet more and more people. Also, they will receive intel on potential marks and their favorite places to visit, and they will try to meet and target those people who may be in those positions that have access to something interesting. Eventually, the spy will try to gain promotions and work their way up into positions with access to vital information or potentially befriend the individuals with such access, and then they will finally have access to that top secret information. So type 2 is definitely a more drawn out process, which has its many challenges as well as requires a ton of patience and discipline, but nonetheless, it gets the job done. You now have an established spy within your enemy's nation, whether it's one of your own agents or one scouted behind enemy lines. You have your inside man who has access to top secret information. Now comes the question, how are you going to move this heavily guarded classified information without the enemy suspecting anything? Well in comes the controller. The controller is the manager of the entire espionage operation. Everything goes through them first. They issue the instructions for obtaining and transmitting information. They train the spy on tradecraft, communication techniques, procedures to follow to avoid being followed and so on. And the way the network should be structured is that the spy will have contact with no one else but the controller. They will never learn the names of any other spies or officials as each spy works within their own compartment so that if they are captured and interrogated, they can't reveal vital information or the identities of other spies because they simply won't know it. This is a huge aspect in preventing the compromisation of the entire espionage network. And with this system in place, and with the controller in position to receive info from and communicate with the spy, the spy is now tasked with retrieving the secretive information from enemy territory and passing it on in complete secrecy. So how is this done? Well, the spy can memorize information and pass that on to the controller, however, it is much more reliable 
to have hard copy evidence. Photocopies, maps, pictures, hard drives, microfilms, etc. Copies and recordings of original documents. Because stealing the actual original documents is a surefire way to blow your cover. If top secret files are found constantly missing ever since your spy walked through their doors, mission failed. Hence, in comes good old trusty spy gadgets. Here's where we have a little fun. Super sensitive microphones, phone wiretaps, seismic equipment to detect nuclear testing, and underwater sensors to find enemy submarines. Spies can also scan, record, and analyze enemy radio frequencies and cell phone traffic. Additionally, let's not forget about remote control insects, wristwatch cameras, poison tip umbrellas, coat button cameras, exploding pencil cases, suitcase transceivers, lipstick and glove guns, as well as in many cases, the use of satellites to oversee the more larger forms of top secret information, such as nuclear base locations, army formations and movements, equipment, etc. The plethora of gadgets at your disposal are extremely advantageous to your espionage network. As a result, spies are able to retrieve these highly classified documents and information and then move it to the controller through a process called the dead drop. A dead drop is a secret hiding place, typically somewhere in public. It could be behind a loose brick in a wall, at the local park, or in a plant at a certain street corner. When a spy has a message to send, they pass by the dead drop and deposit the message casually, without arousing any suspicion. The spy then leaves a signal to let the controller know that there is a message to be retrieved. A cryptic text, a certain marking on the wall, or an anonymous phone call. And a spy will use several dead drops so that they aren't noticed repeatedly visiting the same spot. Thus, the controller, when they receive the signal, will pick up the classified intel and hand it right to you. And there you go. You now have a working espionage network that you can now further grow as you have the systems and people in place to recruit, train, and disperse more spies out into the world. Everything your enemy reads, writes, watches, and talks about is now also in your hands, at your disposal. You see exactly what they're planning, and thus you're able to plan your next moves accordingly. And as tensions further rise, and as the world around you starts to reach the cusp of World War III, you're theoretically chilling because you now have the answer key to the test. You will have the upper hand since you now know everything your enemy knows. You know their army size and equipment, the number of nukes they have, their plans of attack, their strategies, their alliances, their new technologies, biochemical weapons, etc. However, just be careful because this strategy itself isn't a secret. Your enemies could be doing the same exact thing right back to you. After all, you're not the only genius in the world to think of creating an espionage network as intricate as this. And on top of that, if your enemy has already ID'd your spies in their country, they could have coerced them and had them spread misinformation to you. Fake intel. They could be double agents by now, so who knows? All the intel that you've been receiving all of these years could be false, fake news, and there could be enemy spies already integrated within your own government and military without you knowing a single thing, feeding your plans, strategies, and intel to the enemy. You could either be a genius and on the cusp of greatness, 10 steps ahead of your enemies, or you could be the fool who's about to face a rude awakening when war breaks out. Regardless, information is what allows the rich and powerful to bend the world at their will. Information is real power.